continue uh, exploring the wisdom theme, uh, the, also the pathway theme. We're going to be talking about that pathway, and that's why this graphic is important to me. It shows a pathway. It uh, shows that um, we're talking about getting from point A to point B and how we get there and what's involved in getting there. Um, it's, it's been very fascinating for me. Uh, I've read a good number of books, far more books about wisdom than I practice. Can I just be honest for a moment here? I re I've read the Proverbs many, many times. And if I could apply all the things, all the wisdom of Proverbs, the wisdom of the New Testament, the wisdom of the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5, 6, and 7, uh, I would be quite the person <laughs> by God's grace and his strength. I read far more than I put into practice. I preach far more than I put into practice. I confess that to you. Um, but then again, um, you hear more sermons than you put into practice, don't you? Can we just have a moment of acknowledging that? I may not practice everything I preach, but you don't practice everything I preach either. And, uh, or that God's word says, and we're all in process. We actually are all on a spiritual journey, on a pathway. So the first couple of weeks, we asked ourselves, well, and we talked about good questions. We talked about wisdom for a pathway. Remember, we just read this, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. God will, if we lean on him and trust in his understanding, not ours, his wisdom, not ours, he will make our paths straight or smooth or show us the next step. Uh, Psalm 119 verse 105 says, uh, your word is a light unto my path. Isn't that great? Uh, just the next step in the, in the pathway. That's, that's how God leads us. He never gives us much farther than that. We love it, but that's not what God gives us. So good questions lead to better decisions. Your decisions determine the direction and the quality of your life. Right? We talked about that. Oh, no, 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 other people's decisions, other people's choices. I'm a victim of everybody else's choices. We said, no, you're actually not. Yes, you're a victim from those choices. However, you now have choices about your response to their choices. That's the difference between a dog and a human, an insect and a human. Okay, you have agency. You can choose to respond differently than your emotions or your amygdala or your, your reptile brain, if you want to call it that. You know, the flight, fright, freeze, right? All that flight, fight, freeze. Um, all down, that's, that's the initial, wow, a lion's coming at me, I react, I run, I try to climb a tree, I try to attack something that's attacking me, right? Or I just go, ah, I don't know what to do. That's, that's the animal. That's how animals do it. And humans can fall into that trap. But God has actually made us in the image of himself. We have agency. We have the ability to choose, to respond, to decide differently than the circumstances tend to dictate. Are you with me? Is that a good thing? Yeah. Here's the bad thing. You lose all your excuses. See, if you say, I'm a victim, now you say, oh. Gosh, I just can't do anything about it. I was born this way. Thanks, Katy Perry. Um, right, Katy Perry? Did I get that right? Millennials and Gen Z, did I get the right artist? Okay, thank you. Um, I was born this way, right? I, or, or I was treated this way. Or I'm a victim. See, it removes your agency or choice. And now you can be a victim. You say, yeah, it sucks to be me. Just, you know, can't do anything about it. No, that's not what God's word says. Says we have, we can ask questions, we can make choices, we can make decisions, and they the direction determines the quality of our life. So, we asked first week or last week, I should say, the integrity questions. One of five questions. The integrity question is: Am I being honest with myself? Really? See, um, there's a great accountability question. So, um, I used to meet with some guys, I've heard of other guys' groups, and we, always, we have these lists of questions that we sometimes ask each other. And so one of the questions is, have you been faithful to your spouse? Yeah, 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 I've been faithful to my spouse. Um, have you been diligent in handling the resources God's given you? I've been a good steward this past week of God's stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's a question at the end of all the questions. Which of those questions that I just asked you did you not answer completely honestly? Ouch. Right? Because I want to make myself look better than I am. So I'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, 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 it's good, it's good, it's good. And then at the end, yeah, but yeah okay, but really. You know, my, my parents used to ask, my sister or myself, so at the end of uh, my ranting about how bad my teacher was or how tough the school thing was and how I was a victim of uh, the system, right? 
um, rather than letting me rant all somehow sometimes they would say so so Dan how are you otherwise yeah, they would call me Danny so you know what I mean by otherwise other than all of your complaints and victimizing and being vi feeling like a victim how are you otherwise right or another way of saying no am I being honest with you? really like let's be honest okay and so we actually are our worst enemies because the, the Bible says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked who can who can know it who can solve it who can fix it our own hearts deceive us isn't that something we're our worst enemy I was tricked into buying no 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 the salesman in your head trained you and taught you to buy that thing you know well no 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 the salesman no 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 the salesman in your head did it okay you didn't even need you know that the ad did it I've been watching you know hockey playoffs and all the ads and I keep saying no that's not true no we don't need that no that's stupid no you're lying to me I don't need that you have to right otherwise you will you'll not only be convinced by the salesperson in your head everything else the 5,000 did you know that 5,000 advertisements a day that you somehow consume or see I was I'm on a Bible app Bible gateway and I'm getting ads for Temu I'm getting ads for Timex watches I'm getting ads for all kinds of things they're just flashing as I'm looking up Bible verses they're flashing advertisements that you need this you need this you need this sponsored websites that's how they work so you pay a subscription and have no ads uh, but Alcoholics Anonymous says rigorous honesty with ourselves and with others is the first rule of recovery is not the truth Wow so great question number two today is the legacy question the legacy question this is what we're going to be exploring what story do you want to tell in the future or what story do you want told about you oh I don't have any I don't have any choice about that what are you talking about pastor Dan hmm, let's explore that see the good news is you get to decide you get to decide what story you will tell about yourself and what stories other people will tell about you I heard some stories yesterday at a celebration of life for a fire chief former fire chief Dave Tomkinson they were talking about best practices they were talking about training they were talking about safety first they were talking about don't leave the man behind don't leave your man or your partner or your man or woman partner behind and I was like wow um, those choices Dave made to lead his, his team well guess what people were telling at a celebration of life stories of decisions that Dave made to act well to serve well to speak well to lead well see where I'm going with this so other people were telling a story about Dave how did they tell hmm. they were telling things based on the decisions that he made that allowed a good story to be told about him so the good news is you and I get to decide but you decide one decision at a time because you write the story of your life one decision at a time I'm quoting Andy Stanley in better decisions fewer regrets I'd encourage you to read that book and other books he's written about five books about decision four or five um, so the good news is you get to decide isn't that interesting how you respond to things how the story is gonna go what people will say about you you can you can uh, and to a large degree decide that I want to tell you a little bit about my parents story I don't, yeah there we go uh, so my parents story uh, is a, is kind of a series of outcomes connected to a series of really good decisions um, I asked my parents the other day um, wow you know when I think about your story uh, it's an amazing story I just look back and you're faithful to each other you've been married 69 years God willing 70 next next Easter years together wow faithful to each other never had affairs on each other never let addictions get in the way no abuse faithful loving kind my dad had numerous jobs numerous vocations numerous occupations between my father and I we have three master's degrees oh, well I I don't have any but between the two of us we have three <laughs> um, so he he made in, straight-A student I'm not lying um, so my dad uh, is amazing my mom's also tremendously amazing she was a 45-year RN registered nurse and um, so they're 90 and 91 looking after each other but I look back and I'm like I said well I, uh, my mom's I said you have an incredible story you can look back on so many decisions you make 
And I, I get the benefit of you having stayed together and modeling for me how marriages work when people just hang in there. They do hard things. Marriage is hard, right? Singleness is hard. We have to choose our heart, and we have to learn to get better at doing hard things. My parents just got really good at doing hard things. That's all it is. Not that it is easy life. Don't, don't tell them, oh, yeah, well, you don't know my spouse. Well, hey, they have their differences. They're polar opposites in many respects. I'll just tell you that my parents. They chose to work through it. They modeled fighting in front of me and making up in front of me, in front of their children. Yeah. Wow. They just hung in there. See, every single choice they made at every, every juncture, every point, was building a story that we can now tell. The last few family gatherings have been ridiculous. Like, it's like a funeral where we're giving tributes to our parents. And I finally said after the third or fourth family gathering, okay, we're not having a funeral for mom and dad this time. We've already sung their praises, and they're consistently being faithful to each other and loving and kind to us and generous to everybody around them. Yes, we want to honor them, but there, there are other things to celebrate, and we don't want mom and dad to feel like they're at their own funeral. <laughs> uh, we've already done that several times. Bless you, mom and dad. They're, it's all still true, and they're watching this later. So, um, One decision at a time, and my mom says to me, we were FaceTiming together, and she said, um, wow, uh, I, I, we, we didn't really think of that when we were younger that we were doing that. Well, no, you don't, you don't plan on, you don't think, hey, in 69 years, we want a good story to be written, so we're going to make wise decisions every single time, every little thing we're going to do well, we're going to try and do well with God's help. We're going to pray about every decision, we're going to talk to each other, we're going to work it through, we're going to make wise decisions, so that when our kids are in their 60s, they can tell good stories about us. I said, Mom, that's, it's not that you didn't think about it, it's that you just did one decision at a time one. Wow. So for those of us in our later years, like, you know, but somebody said, oh yeah, she was older. I said, how old is she? Um, like 32, I think. <laughs> okay, Gen Z, Gen Alpha. Uh, yeah, 30 is old, sure. I'm double that, so. Uh, but um, for those of us who are older, no, we have some regrets. We look back and, boy, I wish I'd made, I wish I'd really planned every decision better. If you're younger, this is actually a sermon for you if you're younger. Younger, 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 younger. Younger, 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 younger. See, now you are making decisions that will be talked about by your children and grandchildren. Okay? So what you're doing right now matters. I talked to, um, I mentioned doing some counseling on the phone or Zoom once in a while. I said to somebody the other day, I said, you know, um, uh, your child will be 20 someday in 18 and a half years. I said, what story do you want your child to tell about his parents? Yeah, my parents couldn't get along, they broke up, and I had to go back and forth forever. Or my dad got remarried, my mom got remarried, and now I have multiple sets of parents and grandparents. Uh, seems like a blessing, not really. It's challenging to manage all that. I know many people, oh gosh, I wish we'd stay together. This is so complicated. And children says, yeah, I you know, most kids I've talked to in public school or any school, they just talk, yeah, uh, I just say to them, so when do you think, when do you go to your mom's? When do you go to your dad's? I don't even need to say. It's, it's an exception when I talk to many kids and they're like, I said, oh, do you live with your mom and dad? Yeah. I'm like, oh, your mom and dad live together? Like in the same house? And you, like, wow, that's amazing. Okay, it's hard. Yeah, marriage is hard. But the stories, the things, the decisions we make. So I'm talking on the phone on this, in this conversation. I'm saying, so what story do you want to tell in 18 and a half years when your child's 20? Do you want them, do you, I would hope that you'd want your son or daughter to say, my mom and dad had a hard marriage and they stuck it out and they showed what it's like to do hard things well. Now I'm going into my adult life thinking, I'm going to make a relationship work. I know it's going to be hard. We're going to fight probably whoever I marry and then we're going to make up. And then we're going to hang in there until our 69th anniversary. Or, or your child will say, yeah, my parents didn't even make it to their marriage. And they couldn't figure out how to get their stuff together. They just couldn't figure out how to not be selfish. They couldn't figure out how to get along. They didn't care about enough about me to do that well. 
Is that the story you want to tell your son? What story do you want to tell? Because the decision you're about to make right in front of me will determine the story that he will tell because it's his story now. Your choices become his story. And then children's story and grandchildren's story. This is so critical. For those of us who are older, we know this story. We know the regrets that we have. But my parents, I'm so thankful. God bless them. I'll never probably live up to their, their model for me. But I thank you. I am so thankful for what they modeled. So, we better keep moving here. Our private decisions don't remain private. Our personal decisions impact other persons. Once our story becomes their story, it is their story to tell, right? So the great legacy question is, what story do you want to tell? What story do you want to tell? Or uh, what story do you want to be told about you? It will be told. So at decision time, it's a good idea to pause, to look ahead and think about 20 years from now and ask, what is a, and this is important, a true story. What's a true story I want to tell about this right now, in the future, without having to skip any parts. Isn't that the catch? What story I want, can I tell that won't skip any parts, or I won't have to lie about certain parts. I won't be tempted to lie about certain parts, right? Oh yeah, yeah when your mom and I were, uh, yeah, we, uh, yeah, we stuck it out. We were, we were together. We were faithful to each other. Lying, because maybe there wasn't that much faithfulness, and we really didn't keep it together. Okay, the alternative is pause, look ahead and say, it's not so much about what's happening now, it's actually the impact 20 years from now that I'm concerned about, okay? We're going to introduce Joseph, and, and we're going to do a whirlwind tour of his life. The very first sermon I actually preached in this building, I think in June or in July of 2021, uh, was about Joseph, and it came from an entirely different perspective. Yeah, you're doing good. gives him this special jacket. And the ten older sons come to hate Joseph. And so they kidnap him and they plan to kill him, but instead they decide to just sell him into slavery in Egypt where he ends up in prison. Talk about family failure. But God is with Joseph. And he orchestrates Joseph's release from prison and Pharaoh ends up elevating Joseph to second in command over all of Egypt. And so Joseph saves the nation of Egypt during a famine. And he also ends up saving his brothers and his family from starving to death. And so once again, we can see the folly and the sin of Abraham's family is met with God's faithfulness, who subverts even the evil of the brothers into an occasion to save life. And this is actually what Joseph says right near the end of the book. He says to his brothers, you all planned this for evil, but God planned it for good to save many now, these words are strategically placed at the end of the book because they summarize not only the story of Joseph and his brothers, but the book as a whole. From Genesis 3 onward, humans keep acting selfishly and doing evil, but this God is not going to leave his world to its own devices. He remains faithful and determined to bless people despite their failures. You can see this especially in how that mysterious promise about the descendant of the woman gets developed throughout the book. So remember, Genesis 3, God promised that this wounded victor would come and crush the snake and defeat evil at its source. And the author then connects this promise directly to the line of Abraham. This is a part of how God's going to bring his blessing to the nation. Now from Abraham, this promise gets connected to Judah, the fourth son of Jacob. And this is how. In an extremely important poem in chapter 49, an aging Jacob, he's on his deathbed, he wants to bless his 12 sons. And when he comes to Judah, Jacob predicts that Judah will become the tribe of Israel's royal leaders and that one day a king will come who will command the obedience of all the nations and fulfill God's promise to restore the garden blessing to all of the world. And then after this, Jacob dies. And later, Joseph dies too. And the growing family remains in <laughs> so we get a quick overview. 
Uh, let's look at a chronology of Joseph's life very briefly. He's born of Jacob and Rachel in Paddan Aram. At 17 years old, uh, he's a shepherd, loved by his father, hated of his brethren, the Bible says. Uh, his brothers hated him, his 10 brothers. Uh, he was sold into Egypt by his brothers, put, put, put in a pit, taken out of a pit. Hey, let's not kill him. Let's sell him off as a slave. And he becomes the ruler of Potiphar's house. So not only starts as a slave, but he gets so much respect for the choices that he makes and his discipline and his uh, perseverance and hard work, work ethic. But then he's falsely accused of adultery and cast into pr prison. And he's made ruler there as well because he just can't help being faithful to God, it seems like, through his decisions, of course. He interprets the dreams of two fellow inmates, and one is going to die, one's going to live, and he says to one of them, hey, when you get out, put in a good word for me because I'm here in jail for something I didn't do. And the guy forgets about it. Okay, so um, he languishes in prison for two more years, and in the meantime, Isaac dies when Joseph is about 29. So he's 17, and now he's all the way to 29. At age 30 to 37, he interprets Pharaoh's dreams, exalted him, he's exalted to prime minister before the seven years of plenty. Remember, he predicts, if you don't, you can read uh, Genesis 37 to 45-ish, or to 50. He interprets the dream, there are going to be seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, Pharaoh says, if that's true, I want you in charge of all of my grain. So they gather a bunch of grain to distribute it in the next seven years. Um, uh, he marries Asenath and fathers two children, Ephraim and Manasseh, who, by the way, become the two tribes. Instead of Joseph, now there's ten brothers plus Ephraim and Manasseh. They become the twelve tribes of Israel, and Joseph steps back. His two sons step in, if you don't know that part. At age 39... He's reunited with his brother, brothers and father in the second of the uh, seven famine years. You might remember in the story, his brothers come, they don't recognize him, he recognizes them, and he kills them all. No, he doesn't. He makes a very clear decision that leads to the salvation of his family line. We'll talk about that momentarily. Now, so he has dreams as a teenager that his brothers will bow down at his feet. How old is he when that happens? 39. That's a long time to wait for a promise, for a dream to be fulfilled. If you're praying for a loved one to come to faith, if you're praying for someone to be healed, are you ready to pray this long or longer for that? Because that's what Joseph had to do. Uh, many obstacles in the meantime developed his character. But they eventually bow down to him, and they say he's the second highest leader in Egypt, and they need food for their family to go back. Um, to where they came from. And uh, we'll talk about the rest of the story momentarily. But through all of this, through every decision that he made in response to what other people did to him, keep in mind, um, God was with Joseph. Loved by his father, and he was the overseer of all of his brothers, but he was sold into Egypt. God was with him, it says. Elevated to overseer of all Potter's household, but cast into prison, God was still with him. Elevated to overseer of all the prison, but forgotten by his prison mate. God was with him. Elevated over to all the land of Egypt. God was with him. Loved and honored by the whole world in 41 through 50. Um, tremendous legacy because of the choices. The responses that Joseph made to being a victim of other people's problems, other people's judgments, other people's abuse of him. If you think you're, you're a victim, you need to have a conversation with Joseph. You need to have a conversation with Job. You need to have a conversation with Jesus and all of the disciples. Jesus did not promise you a rose garden, and if he did, it includes thorns. We all go through hard times. You don't have a corner on it. There's no monopoly when it comes to hard times. But God was with him. So let's break it down in our final uh, little while here in our talk before our time of communion. So Joseph's brothers tell their story later. I want you to imagine, you meet Joseph's brothers later in life, and you're like, hey, what's your story? Tell us your story. What's, uh, you know, what's your life been like? And they said, well, one of them says, well, when I was in my 20s, I hated my younger brother so much that I sold him into slavery and then told my dad he was killed by wild animals. Then I spent the rest of my life lying about what happened to my younger brother, all because I was jealous. Yeah, that's, that's the story. And, they, and he did. The brothers lied. Hey, Dad, I must have had eaten up my wild animals. Look, here's that multicolored coat you gave him. It's got blood all over it, so I guess he's dead. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay, what's Joseph's story way later in life, like 
after his life? Okay. Imagine if you're talking to him now in heaven, you met him on the streets, and he's like, hey, Joe, what's your story? Well, I was kidnapped and sold into slavery. I was a victim. And I decided not to live like a victim. I chose to trust God and do the best I could with what I had. Wow. That's a, is that a different story? Okay, first story, Joseph Brothers. Yeah, I lied, made poor choices. I had to lie some more. Um, yeah. Um, wow. Joe, I was kidnapped and sold into slavery. I was a victim. I rose above it by God's grace, of course, and good decisions. Okay, here's another uh, part of his uh, reality about him. While Joseph faced many setbacks, of every, at every critical juncture, he responded with a decision that would allow him and us to later tell his story without skipping any parts. See, right now, we can look back on Joseph's story and say, hey, Joseph was a great guy, oh, except for that adultery thing. Joseph was a great guy, oh, yeah, except he killed his ten brothers, you know, well, nine of them because his younger brother was his favorite, so he didn't kill him, but... Um, and then uh, when his brother showed up, he said, yeah, you guys don't get any food because you're not from here and you were mean to me. And therefore, Jacob's dad died and his brothers dried up and shriveled up. And there's no nation of Israel. And Jesus wasn't born to the tribe of Judah because they all died. That could have been a story. Think about that. That's the, that's, that's the train of events. Right? At every critical juncture, he responded with a decision that would allow him, and us right now, we're telling a story, that allows us to later tell the story without skipping parts, because there are no parts to skip. The Bible doesn't skip parts. By the way, all the disciples, all their mistakes, they're in there. Isn't that something? All people's doubts, all people's whining, David, why have you forsaken me, God? God hasn't forsaken him. It's in the Bible. It's just honest. The Bible's tremendously honest. Nobody can make this stuff up. If you're making up a story about God and you want it to be just, you just include the good parts. The Bible includes everything. And Joseph's story, we can tell every part of it because every decision, because of every decision he made. So here was another part of Joseph's story that he could tell later. Uh, you're, actually, he told the story to Potiphar's wife. His boss's wife wanted him to sleep with her. Your husband, he says to her, gave me an opportunity I never dreamed would come my way, so I chose to be faithful to him, and as always, to the God who's been watching out for me. I'm glad I can tell my story without skipping this part. Or, I chose to assist a fellow prisoner, and while the favor was not returned, I can look back and know that my decision to treat him kindly is a story I want told about me. Or how about this? When I was reunited with my backstabbing and lying brothers, he didn't say that, but we know that's true, I had the chance to get revenge times 10. I decided to be merciful and forgive them, a story that led to a future of provision and blessing for generations to come, including Jesus, the Lion of Judah, and of Joseph's brothers. And that's a story that we're still, in, still telling today. So Joseph's decisions, let's talk about that. When, see, when you decide what everybody expects you to set aside, right? So if, if somebody does something to you and you decide to get revenge, people go, well, yeah, that's what you do. That's what you do. That's what every good show is about, right? Getting revenge. That's what a lot of shows are about, getting revenge. You see, when you decide what everybody wants you to decide, that is, what they would decide if they were you, nobody even notices because it's what's expected. But when you decide against the norm or against the tide, against human nature, your story suddenly stands out. See, Joseph had decided years earlier to live a life worth telling, to live a story worth telling. He had been deciding a good story for 13 years up till this point deciding a good story. He wasn't going to ruin it now with a revenge chapter or an adultery chapter or a, right? He didn't want to ruin the story by throwing in one of those kind of chapters. So Joseph's brothers decided a story that they spent their lives hiding, a story that made them liars for life. Oh, and by the way, read Genesis 45 to 50. Even after Joseph is merciful and compassionate to them and they get food and everything, they get together and say, yeah, but, and they tell another 
lie to Joseph. Read about it. You can't make this stuff up. I'm telling you, if you don't read the Bible, you're missing out a lot. This is some crazy stuff, these stories in the Old Testament especially. So they told a story that they, they had to lie about for the rest of their lives. Wow. But Joseph had a story he was proud to tell without skipping any parts. So like Joseph and like his brothers, you and I are writing our stories. One decision at a time and one day at a time. We're writing a story, one decision at a time, one day at a time. So don't ever make a decision that, you, that will make you a liar for life. Long after whatever you gained by lying is gone, you'll be left with your lie. I lied so I could get this. Yeah, well, that thing's going to shrivel up, and all you'll be left with is your lie and your, your bad story. You'll be left with a story you won't be proud to tell. What story do you want to tell? And what chapters in your life, are there any chapters you wish, for those of us who are older, any chapters you'd like, oh, I'd like to just erase that, undo, backspace, delete? Any stories you wish you could rewrite? All of us, at least in my age, we all have those. It's called regret. Oh, I wish, I really regret but chances are the decisions that led to your greatest regrets, think about this, could have been avoided if you had paused to ask yourself, what story do I want to tell? I did ask this uh, recently in a counseling session. I said, um, you just told me a whole bunch of things. Uh, I wonder if you wish you had asked yourself more questions earlier. So, oh, yeah, yeah, there were some really good questions I should have asked. I should have paused. Because now I'm telling a story only three years later that could have looked differently if I'd asked better questions a little bit earlier, just three years ago. Wow. So we're still telling Joseph's story. Why? Because of the incredibly good story he wrote one decision at a time. In Genesis 45, we begin to see what his choices made possible. So good choices, good decisions lead to outcomes. And in this case, the stakes are high. I've already gave it away. Jesus, and the lion, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Joseph's decisions meant Judah would live and that Jesus would exist and that he would be a, a blessing to the world, that he would be born uh, of the tribe of Judah. So the seemingly small choices he made along the way set a course toward the destination where he had now arrived. So Think about this. This is really behind this entire series, the principle of the path. That's why that graphic's been there of the path, and that's why this guy's standing on the screen walking on a path to illustrate that we're all in a path. So the principle of the path is this. Your direction is where you will end up. <laughs> Big news, right? You're like, oh, Pastor Dan, really? All of this to get to that? That's so obvious. But you and I don't necessarily live that way, do we? See, the principle of that is your direction is where you will end up. Last week I said, if I was traveling this way, and I say, I intend to go to Lacombe, you would say, no, Dan, you're going to get to stuff. See, intention doesn't matter. It means nothing. Direction matters. Your direction is where you will end up. Point A to point B, you decide the decisions you will make between here, point A, to get to point B, your choice, your decision. And you decide now where you will end up. If you say, well, you know what, I, I, when, I, when I was younger, I thought, well, I'm going to be married, have kids, and I'm going to retire when I'm X, or this and that. But, but let's say back when you're 18, but getting drunk and showing up late for work and losing my job, well, you know, you know, when you're young, you just party a bit, and then it led to a pregnancy, and then it led to a lost job, and then it led to an accident, and then it led to, and then it led to, and then suddenly you're not at retirement at age 40, you're not married, your kids are split up, and you're saying, oh, you mean those decisions there, I mean that, I, I, I was, I thought it was going the right direction, but no, each of those decisions and choices led that direction, not that direction. That direction implies intentional choices, wise decisions. Then Joseph said to his brothers, remember, brothers come. Now, it's a bit messy. Don't get me wrong. Joseph wasn't perfect. 
Okay, Joseph's like, oh, man, I want to kill these guys. Oh, man, I want to get revenge. Oh, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this miserable for these guys for a while. He, he actually did. He, he was tempted with all of the stuff that you and I are tempted. Let's be honest, right? I, I, you know, I, I've had terrible thoughts about people that I have not acted on. There was a barking dog when we used to live in Red Deer. Barked for two years straight. I imagined five different ways of causing the bo- dog to stop barking. Some of them were compassionate. Some of them not so much. Some of them were even a little not so legal. I didn't act on any one of them. But I murdered that dog in my heart. <laughs> That's what Jesus says. If you anger in your heart, you committed murder. So Joseph struggled. He struggled. Joseph said to his brothers, though, after all this was wrapped up, and he's like, okay, I got my head straight. God, help me. Oh, my heart, my heart. I forgive them. When they had... Uh, gone come close to him after they'd wet their pants and changed their diaper because he recognized who they were. Think about that. Like, Joseph is now in charge of Egypt. We're dead. We're dead. We're dead. We're dead. Right? He says, no, 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 no. Come, come close. When they'd done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph. <gasps> Remember the one you sold into Egypt? <gasps> and now, don't be distressed. Do not fear. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because why? It was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. To preserve you, a remnant on earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Joseph is a type of Jesus. God put Joseph there to facilitate the rescue and delivery of his people. God sent Jesus to facilitate the salvation and rescue of all of us. Joseph is a type of Christ, a symbol of Christ. That is why Joseph can say, hey, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. There's a sovereign plan, but I had to cooperate with God. You know what? We have to cooperate with God and his sovereignty. Yeah, we cooperate with him. So we're still telling Joseph's story. What story do you want to be told about you? And you get to decide. Because you write the story of your life, a decision at the time. So, in, in, in closing, the legacy decision is this. I encourage you to enter into this decision yourselves. I will decide a story I'm proud to tell. I will not decide anything that I'll be tempted to lie about later. That's a decision you can make, especially as a younger person, but even as an, an aging person. By the way, if you have a lot of regrets, there's, there's a way to, you know, there's a starting point. Tell God you're regretful. Tell your children. Tell your spouse. Tell your ex. You know what? I take responsibility for my part. I wasn't that great of a dad. I wasn't that great of a spouse. I struggled with alcohol. I struggled with abuse. I was a terrible person. Uh, not a great citizen. I didn't hold down a job. I didn't stick it out. I didn't fight for you. I didn't fight for our family. I didn't fight for our marriage. You can start by going back and saying, hey, um, is there any chance you'd forgive me? God will forgive you. But you. You can find reconciliation. The God of reconciliation wants you to go back and begin that process as you're able. I know we've lost some of our loved ones. We can't go back and say sorry to them. But we can begin to do what we can. I will decide a story, because stories come from decisions, that I'm proud to tell. Don't have to skip any parts. I will not decide to do anything or I'll I'll make good choices so that I won't be tempted to lie about those things later like Joseph's brothers. God, wow, I have just been struck by this story of Joseph. I love the story of Joseph. Thanks for including it in your word. Thank you that we can learn so much from this story of Jacob's family. Jacob, the liar, the deceiver. And yet his children, uh, many continue to lie. But now we got the shining Joseph here who says, no, I'm going to break the chain. I'm going to break that chain. I'm going to be different. I'm going to honor God. I'm going to make wise decisions. I'm going to trust in the Lord with all my heart, not my own understanding. I don't know how this is working out. I don't get it. But I'm going to trust God. And I'm going to keep making one decision after another. Thank you for your grace. For those of us who are with regrets, we're looking at our past and we're going, oh, how could I ever make amends? How could I do it? 
And we need your help, Jesus. Thank you that your grace is sufficient. Just as we hear this song, your grace is amazing. You're amazing. Uh, we, we should be begging you and begging you and begging you for just a little ounce of your goodness, and yet you just it just flows freely to us through the cross, through the blood, through the, the body of Jesus. You broke it for us. Your blood was spilt for us, and it flows towards us. It's not trickling. You're not stingy. Thank you as we come into this time of communion.